Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Time Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. Before we get on with the show, I'd like to take a minute to thank you the listener. You're welcome if you're new, but if you've been around with the show since it started, I'm very grateful to that. Because people who have listened, shared and supported the show in many wonderful and kind ways are the reason the podcast is still around. Thanks to your support, dear friend and dear listener, Sleepy Time Tales has reached whole new heights, and I believe we can go a lot further together. Simply by spreading the word, you can help me in my mission to give more people a restful night's sleep. To do my small part, our small part, in improving their lives. So if you know someone who's struggling to sleep, just let them know. Whether it's in person or via social media. And if you tell people on social media, make sure to tag me in. That's at Sleepy Time Tales on Instagram or Twitter, so that I can see and I can thank you. If you would also like to support Sleepy Time Tales to help me to keep it ad-free and going out to thousands of insomniacs just like you, please consider supporting on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash sleepytimetales. This is monthly support that not only helps me keep the lights on, but you can get fun bonuses based on how much you contribute. I've recently updated the monthly bonuses. My mini short stories have now become poetry readings. I'm dedicating this month to Emily Dickinson. I did my first episode of those last week, and I've got some more coming now. That weekly reading goes out to patrons at the $5 level. So if you're interested in that, you can take a peek. Well, there are levels of support starting at $2. So once again, that's patreon.com slash sleepytimetales or patron.sleepytimetales.net. If monthly seems like a big ask, then you can make once-off tips through Buy Me A Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash sleepytimetales or the tip jar on the website. There's also the merchandise app on the Tee Public Store, which you can reach through the show notes or via the website sleepytimetales.net. And I even there have linked to works by other artists, other creators, so if... Uh, what I have on offer doesn't quite grab you. There's other cool stuff available to you as well. Okay, I've gone on a bit long tonight. Sorry about that. So let me just give a quick shout out to the music, which is Sweet Nights and Friends by Kumiko, available on their website at loyaltyfreakmusic.com. And uh, I'll say thank you very much, and let's get back to the show. So what exactly is Sleepy Town Tales? What is it for? What is this strange idea, this podcast, that you're supposed to fall asleep to? But lack of sleep is a health crisis in the 21st century, and this is a podcast intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. Sleepy Time Tales is intended to be used as a distraction to what keeps you awake at night, or sometimes background noise or even simply company. That's why I make the episodes quite long, so that I'm here for you without any pressure of the end coming. Now as far as I know, there's a couple of different ways to engage with the show. The primary idea is that it gives you something to focus on, a story or an event that lets you keep your mind on a specific point, to stop it from spinning out into stress and anxiety. 
to help you to focus just enough not to resist the embrace of a night's sleep when it comes for you. But maybe you need something different. Maybe you're one of those who need some kind of background, some kind of white noise. As people these days are listen to white noise machines or the sound of the ocean, or the sound of the rain or the wind in the trees, or maybe even just some boring dude droning on in the background. It's important that you don't try force the sleep. As I'm talking, just keep a light mental grip on the thread of the story and allow the need for sleep to come for you. Now obviously I'm hoping that you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but it's important you don't feel pressurized. If this is your first night with us, this actually probably won't work for you. It'll probably take a couple of nights, so I recommend giving it a good solid three nights to get used to the idea of listening to my voice, my accent, or maybe initially one episode just isn't long enough. Or maybe your problem is a little bit different, maybe your problem isn't so much going to sleep. Maybe you wake up in the middle of the night. What I can recommend is, because it's what's worked for me over the years, is to let the show play all night. Download a whole bunch of episodes, enough to last you 8 hours or 10 hours. Start on the latest in the playlist and just let them go. That way, if you find yourself awake at 3am, staring at the ceiling, you can just carry on listening. Pop your earbuds in if they've fallen out, or carry on listening on your little smart speaker, however it is you're listening, and allow yourself to go back to sleep. You can even do the same thing if you wake up just before your alarm. This is something I've had people thank me for suggesting to them. Because if you do the same thing 60 minutes or 30 minutes before your alarm and fall back asleep again, I don't know what it is, but there is something about it that makes it the most relaxing part of your night. That just letting go on, on the, at, before the alarm is satisfying on a deep, deep level. But it's important that you try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, this may seem strange to you. So I ask that you give it a chance. Because I'm here to work with you, to create a safe space, a cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream. Today we return to Lady Audley's Secret by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter 3 Hidden Relics The same August sun which had gone down behind the waste of waters glimmered redly upon the broad face of the old clock tower over that ivy-covered archway that leads into the gardens of Audley Court. A fierce and crimson sunset. The mullioned windows and twinkling lattices are all ablaze with the red glory. The fading light flickers upon the leaves of the limes in the long avenue, and changes the still fish pond into a sheet of burnished copper. Even into those dim recesses of briar and brushwood, amidst which the old well is hidden, the crimson brightness penetrates in fitful flashes, till the dank weeds and rusty iron wheel and broken woodwork seem as if they were flecked with blood. The lowing of a cow in the quiet meadows, the splash of a trout in the fish pond, the last notes of a tired bird, the creaking of wagon wheels upon the distant road, every now and then breaking the evening silence, only made the stillness of the place seem more intense. It was almost oppressive, this twilight stillness. The very repose of the place grew painful from its intensity, and you felt as if a corpse must be lying somewhere within that grey and ivy-covered pile of building. So death-like was the tranquillity of all around. As the clock over the archway struck eight, a door at the back of the house was softly opened, and a girl came out into the gardens. But even the presence of a human being scarcely broke the silence for the girl crept slowly over the thick grass, 
and gliding into the avenue by the side of the fish pond, disappeared in the rich shelter of the limes. She was not, perhaps, positively a pretty girl, but her appearance was of that order which is commonly called interesting. Interesting it may be, because in the pale face and the light grey eyes, the small features and compressed lips, there was something which hinted at a power of repression and self-control, not common in a woman of nineteen or twenty. She might have been pretty, I think, but for one fault in her small oval face. This fault was an absence of colour. Not one tinge of crimson flushed the waxen whiteness of her cheeks. Not one shadow of brown redeemed the pale insipidity of her eyebrows and eyelashes. Not one glimmer of gold or auburn relieved the dull flaxen of her hair. Even her dress was spoilt by the same deficiency. The pale lavender muslin faded into a sickly grey, and the ribbon knotted around her throat melted into the same spectral hue. Her figure was slim and fragile, and in spite of her humble dress she had something of the grace and carriage of a gentlewoman. But she was only a simple country girl, called Phoebe Marks, who had been nursemaid in Mr. Dawson's family, and whom Lady Audley had chosen for her maid after her marriage with Sir Markle. Of course, this was a wonderful piece of good fortune for Phoebe, who found her wages trebled, and her work lightened in the well-ordered household at the court, and who was therefore quite as much the object of envy among her particular friends as my lady herself to higher circles. A man who was sitting on the broken woodwork of the well started as the lady's maid came out of the dim shade of the limes, and stood before him among the weeds and brushwood. I have said before that this was a neglected spot. It lay in the midst of a low shrubbery, hidden away from the rest of the gardens and only visible from the garret windows at the back of the west wing. Why, well, Phoebe, said the man, shutting a clasp knife in which he had been stripping the bark from a blackthorn stake, you came upon me so still and sudden that I thought you an evil spirit. I've come across to the fields and come in here at the gate again the moat, and I was taking a rest before I came up to the house to ask if you was come back. I can see the well from my bedroom window, Luke, Phoebe answered, pointing to an open lattice on one of the gables. I saw you sitting here and came down to have a chat. It's better talking out here than in the house where there's always somebody listening. The man was a big, broad-shouldered, stupid-looking clodhopper of about twenty-three years of age. His dark, red hair grew low upon his forehead, and his bushy brows met over a pair of greenish-gray eyes. His nose was large and well-shaped, but the mouth was coarse in form and animal in expression. Rosy-cheeked, red-haired, and bull-necked, he was not unlike one of the stout oxen grazing in the meadows around about the court. The girl seated herself lightly upon the woodwork at his side and put one of her hands, which had grown white in her new and easy service, about his thick neck. "'Are you glad to see me, Luke?' she asked. "'Of course I'm glad, lass,' he answered, boorishly opening his knife again and scraping away at the hedge stake. They were first cousins, and had been playfellows in childhood and sweethearts in early youth. You don't seem much as if you were glad, said the girl. You might look at me, Luke, and tell me if you think my journey has improved me. It ain't put any colours in your cheeks, my girl, he said, glancing up at her from under his lowering eyebrows. You're every bit as white as you was when you went away. But they say travelling makes people genteel, Luke. I've been on the continent with my lady, through all manner of curious places. And you know, when I was a child, Squire Horton's daughters taught me to speak a little French, and I found it so nice to be able to talk to the people abroad. 
genteel, cried Luke Marx with a hoarse laugh. Who wants you to be genteel, I wonder? Not me, for one. When you're my wife, you won't have over much for time for gentility, my girl. French, too. Dang me, Phoebe. I suppose when we've saved money enough between us to buy a bit of a farm, you'll be polyvooing to the cows. She bit her lip as her lover spoke and looked away. He went on cutting and chopping at a rude handle he was fashioning to the stake, whistling softly to himself all the while, not once looking at his cousin. For some time they were silent, but by and by she said, with her face still turned away from her companion, What a fine thing it is for Miss Graham, that was, to travel with her maid and a courier, and a chariot and four, and a husband who thinks there isn't one spot upon all the earth that's good enough for her to set her foot upon. Aye, it is a fine thing, Phoebe, to have lots of money, answered Luke, and I hope you'll be warned by that, my lass, to save up your wages again we get married. Why, what was she in Mrs. Dawson's house only three months ago? continued the girl, as if she had not heard her cousin's speech. What was she but a servant like me, taking wages and working for them as hard or harder than I did? You should have seen her shabby clothes, Luke, worn and patched and darned and turned and twisted, yet always looking nice upon her somehow. She gives me more as lady's maid here than ever she got from Mr. Dawson then. Why, I've seen her come out of the parlour with a few sovereigns and a little silver in her hand that Master had just given her for a quarter's salary. And now look at her. Never you mind her, said Luke. Take care of yourself, Phoebe. That's all you've got to do. What should you say to a public house for you and me, by and by, my girl? There's a deal of money to be made out of a public house. The girl still sat with her face averted from her lover, her hands hanging listlessly in her lap, and her pale grey eyes fixed upon the last low streak of crimson dying out behind the trunks of the trees. You should see the inside of the house, Luke, she said. It's a tumble-down looking place enough outside, but you should see my lady's rooms. All pictures and gilding and great-looking glasses that stretch from the ceiling to the floor. Painted ceilings, too, that cost hundreds of pounds, the housekeeper told her, and all done for her. She's a lucky one, muttered Luke, with lazy indifference. You should have seen her while we were abroad, with a crowd of gentlemen hanging about her. Sir Michael was not jealous of them, only proud to see her so much admired. You should have heard her laugh and talk with them, throwing all their compliments and fine speeches back at them, as it were, as if they had been pelting her with roses. She set everybody mad about her wherever she went. Her singing, her playing, her painting, her dancing, her beautiful smile and sunshiny ringlets. She was always the talk of the place, as long as we stayed in it. Is she at home tonight? No. She's gone out with Sir Michael to a dinner party at the beaches. They have seven or eight miles to drive, and they won't be back till after eleven. Then I'll tell you what, Phoebe. If the inside of the house is so mighty fine, I should like to take a look at it. You shall then. Mrs. Barton, the housekeeper, knows you by sight, and she can't object to my showing you some of the best rooms. It was almost dark when the cousins left the shrubbery and walked slowly to the house. The door by which they entered led into the servants' hall, on one side of which was the housekeeper's room. Phoebe Mark stopped for a moment to ask the housekeeper if she might take her cousin through some of the rooms, and having received permission to do so, lighted a candle at the lamp in the hall, and beckoned Luke to follow her into the other parts of the house. The long black oak corridors were dim in the ghostly twilight. The light carried by Phoebe looking only a poor speck in the broad passages through which the girl led her cousin. 
Luke looked suspiciously over his shoulder now and then, half frightened by the creaking of his own hobnailed boots. It's a mortal dull place, Phoebe, he said, as they emerged from a passage into the principal hall, which was not yet lighted. I've heard tell of a murder that was done here in the old times. There are murders enough in these times as to that, Luke, answered the girl, ascending the staircase, followed by the young man. She led the way through a great drawing room. Rich in satin and ormolu, bull and inlaid cabinets, bronzes, cameos, statuettes and trinkets, that glistened in the dusky light. Then through a morning room, hung with proof engravings of valuable pictures, through this into an antechamber where she stopped, holding the light above her head. The young man stared about him, open-mouthed and open-eyed. It's a rare fine place, he said, and must have cost a heap of money. Look at the pictures on the wall, said Phoebe, glancing at the panels of the octagonal chamber, which are hung with claws and pussines, fovermans and capes. I've heard that these alone are worth a fortune. This is the entrance to my lady's apartments, Miss Graham that was. She lifted a heavy, green cloth curtain, which hung across the doorway and led the astonished countryman into a fairy-like boudoir, and thence to a dressing room in which the open doors of a wardrobe and a heap of dresses flung about a sofa showed that it remained exactly as its occupants had left it. I've got all these things to put away before my lady comes home, Luke. You might sit down here while I do it. I shan't be long. Her cousin looked around in gawky embarrassment, bewildered by the splendor of the room, and after some deliberation selected the most substantial of the chairs, on the extreme edge of which he carefully seated himself. I wish I could show you the jewels, Luke, said the girl, but I can't, for she always keeps the keys herself. That's the case on the dressing table there. What, that? cried Luke, staring at the massive walnut wood and brass inlaid casket. Why, that's big enough to hold every bit of clothes I've got. And it's as full as can be of diamonds, rubies, pearls and emeralds, answered Phoebe. Busy as she spoke in folding the rustling silk dresses and laying them one by one upon the shelves of the wardrobe. As she was shaking out the flounces of the last, a jingling sound caught her ear, and she put her hand into the pocket. I declare, she exclaimed, my lady has left her keys in her pocket for once in a way. I can show you the jewellery if you like, Luke. Well, I may as well have a look at it, my girl, he said, rising from his chair and holding the light while his cousin unlocked the casket. He uttered a cry of wonder when he saw the ornaments glittering on white satin cushions. He wanted to handle the delicate jewels, to pull them about and find out their mercantile value. Perhaps a pang of longing and envy shot through his heart as he thought, I would like to have taken one of them. Why, one of these diamond things would set us up in life, Phoebe, he said turning a bracelet over and over in his big red hands. Put it down, Luke. Put it down directly, cried the girl, with a look of terror. How can you speak about such things? He laid the bracelet in its place with a reluctant sigh and then continued his examination of the casket. What's this? he asked pleasantly pointing to a brass knob in the framework of the box. He pushed it as he spoke, and a secret drawer, lined with purple velvet, flew out of the casket. Looky here, cried Luke, pleased at his discovery. 
Phoebe Marks threw down the dress she had been folding and went over to the toilet table. Why, I never saw this before, she said. On what there is in it. There was not much in it. Neither gold nor gems. Only a baby's little worsted shoe rolled up in a piece of paper. And a tiny lock of pale and silky yellow hair. Evidently taken from a baby's head. Phoebe's eyes dilated as she examined the little packet. So this is what my lady hides in the secret drawer, she muttered. It's queer rubbish to keep in such a place, said Luke carelessly. The little girl's thin lip curved into a curious smile. You will bear me witness where I found this, she said, putting the little parcel into her pocket. Why, Phoebe, you're not going to be such a fool as to take that, cried the young man. I'd rather have this than the diamond bracelet you would have liked to take, she answered. You shall have the public house, Luke. Chapter 4 In the first page of The Times Robert Audley was supposed to be a barrister. As a barrister was his name inscribed in the law list. As a barrister, he had chambers in Fig Tree Court Temple. As a barrister, he'd eaten the allotted number of dinners which formed the sublime ordeal, through which the forensic aspirant wades on to fame and fortune. If these things can make a man a barrister, Robert Audley decided was one. But he had never either had a brief, or tried to get a brief, or even wished to have a brief in all those five years during which his name had been painted upon one of the doors in Fig Tree Court. He was a handsome, lazy, good-for-nothing fellow of about seven and twenty, the only son of a younger brother of Sir Michael Audley. His father had left him four hundred pounds a year, which his friends had advised him to increase by being called to the bar, and as he found it, after due consideration, more trouble to oppose the wishes of these friends than to eat so many dinners, and to take a set of chambers in the temple, he adopted the latter course, and unblushingly called himself a barrister. Sometimes when the weather was very hot, and he had exhausted himself with the exertion of smoking his German pipe and reading French novels, he would stroll into the temple gardens and lying in some shady spot, pale and cool, with a shirt collar turned down and a blue silk handkerchief tied loosely about his neck, would tell grave benchers that he had knocked himself up with overwork. The sly old benchers laughed at the pleasant fiction, but they all agreed that Robert Audley was a good fellow, a generous-hearted fellow, rather a curious fellow too, with a fund of sly wit and quiet humour under his listless, dawdling, indifferent, irresolute manner. A man who would never get on in the world, but who would not hurt a worm. Indeed, his chambers were converted into a perfect dog kennel, by his habit of bringing home stray and benighted curs, who were attracted by his looks in the street and followed him with abject fondness. Robert always spent the hunting season at Audley Court. Not that he was distinguished in Nimrod, for he would quietly trot to covert upon a mild-tempered, stout-limbed bay hack, and keep at a very respectful distance from the hard riders. His horse knowing quite as well as he did that nothing was further from his thoughts than any desire to be in at the death. The young man was a great favourite with his uncle, and by no means despised by his pretty, light-hearted, hoydenish cousin, Miss Alicia Audley. It might have seemed to other men that the partiality of a young lady who was sole heiress to a fine estate was rather well worth cultivating. But it did not so occur to Robert Audley. Alicia was a very nice girl, he said. A jolly girl, with no nonsense about her. A girl of a thousand. But this was the highest point to which enthusiasm could carry him. The idea of turning his cousin's girlish liking for him to some good account never entered his idle brain. 
I doubt if he even had any correct notion of the amount to his uncle's fortune. And I'm certain that he never for one moment calculated upon the chances of any part of that fortune ultimately coming to himself. So that when one fine spring morning, about three months before the time of which I am writing, the postman brought him the wedding cards of Sir Michael and Lady Audley, together with a very indignant letter from his cousin, setting forth how her father had just married a wax dollish young person, no older than Alicia herself, with flaxen ringlets and a perpetual giggle. For I'm sorry to say that Miss Audley's animus caused her thus to describe the pretty musical laugh, which had been so much admired in the late Miss Lucy Graham. When I say these documents reached Robert Audley, they elicited neither vexation nor astonishment in the lymphatic nature of that gentleman. He read Alicia's angry crossed and recrossed letter without so much as removing the amber mouthpiece of his German pipe from his moustached lips. When he had finished the perusal of the epistle, which he read with his dark eyebrows elevated to the centre of his forehead, his only manner of expressing surprise, by the way, he deliberately threw that and the wedding cards into the waste paper basket, and putting down his pipe, prepared himself for the exertion of thinking out the subject. I always said the old buffer would marry, he muttered, after about an hour's reverie. Alicia and my lady, the stepmother, will go at it hammer and tongs. I hope they won't quarrel in the hunting season. But say unpleasant things to each other at the dining table. Rouse always upset a man's digestion. At about twelve o'clock in the morning following that night, upon which the events recorded in my last chapter had taken place, the baronet's nephew strolled out of the temple. Brackfriars were on his way home to the city. He had in an evil hour obliged some necessitous friend by putting the ancient name of Audley across a bill of accommodation, which bill not having been provided for by the drawer, Robert was called upon to pay. For this purpose he sauntered up Ludgate Hill, with his blue necktie fluttering in the hot August air, and thence to a refreshing cool banking house in a shady court out of St. Paul's churchyard, where he made arrangements for selling out a couple of hundred pounds worth of consoles. He had transacted this business and was loitering at the corner of the court, waiting for a chance handsome to convey him back to the temple, when he was almost knocked down by a man of about his own age, who dashed headlong into the narrow opening. Be so good as to look where you're going, my friend, Robert remonstrated, mildly, to the impetuous passenger. You might give a man warning before you throw him down and trample upon him. The stranger stopped suddenly, looked very hard at the speaker and then gasped for breath. Bobby cried in a tone expressive of the most intense astonishment. I only touched British ground after dark last night, and to think that I should meet you this morning. I've seen you somewhere before, my bearded friend, said Mr. Audley, calmly scrutinizing the animated face of the other. But I'll be hanged if I can remember when or where. What? exclaimed the stranger reproachfully. You don't mean to say that you've forgotten George Talboys? No, I have not, said Robert, with an emphasis by no means usual to him, and then hooking his arm into that of a friend he led him into the shady court, saying with his old indifference, and now, George, tell us all about it. George Tellboys did tell him all about it. He told that very story which he had related ten days before to the pale governess on board the Argus. And then, hot and breathless, he said that he had twenty thousand pounds or so in his pocket, and that he wanted to bank it at his bankers, who had been his many years before. If you'll believe me, I've only just left the counting house, said Robert. I'll go back with you and we'll settle that matter in five minutes. They did contrive to settle it in about a quarter of an hour, 
and then Robert Audley was for starting off immediately for the Crown and Scepter at Greenwich, or the castle at Richmond, where they could have a bit of dinner, and talk over those good old times when they were together at Eton. But George told his friend that before he went anywhere, before he shaved or broke his fast, or in any way refreshed himself after a night journey from Liverpool by express train, he must call at a certain coffee house in Bridge Street, Westminster, where he expected to find a letter from his wife. As they dashed to Ludgate Hill, Fleet Street and the Strand in a fast hansom, George Talboys poured into his friend's ear all his wild hopes and dreams which had usurped such dominion over his sanguine nature. I shall take a villa on the banks of the Thames, Rob, he said, for the little wife and myself, and we'll have a yacht, bobble boy, and you shall lie on the deck and smoke, while my pretty one plays her guitar and sings songs to us. She's for all the world like one of those what's-his-names who got poor Ulysses into trouble, added the young man whose classic law was not very great. The waiters at the Westminster Coffee House stared at the hollow-eyed, unshaven stranger with his clothes of colonial cut and his boisterous, excited manner. But he had been an old frequenter of the place in his military days, and when they heard who he was, they flew to do his bidding. He did not want much. Only a bottle of soda water, and to know if there was a letter at the bar directed to George Talboys. The waiter brought the soda water before the young men had seated themselves in a shady box near the disused fireplace. No, there was no letter for that name. The waiter said it with consummate indifference, while he mechanically dusted the little mahogany table. George's face blanched to a deadly whiteness. Tell boys, he said. Perhaps you didn't hear the name distinctly. T A L B O Y S. Go and look again. There must be a letter. The waiter shrugged his shoulders as he left the room and returned in three minutes to say there was no name at all resembling Tullboy's in the letter rack. There was Brown and Sanderson and Pitchbeck, only three letters altogether. The young man drank his soda water in silence and then leaning his elbows on the table covered his face with his hands. There was something in his manner which told Robert Audley that his disappointment trifling as it may appear, was in reality a very bitter one. He seated himself opposite to his friend, but did not attempt to address him. By and by, George looked up, and mechanically taking a greasy Times newspaper of the day before, from a heap of journals on the table, stared vacantly at the first page. I cannot tell how long he sat blankly staring at one paragraph among the list of deaths, before his dazed brain took in its full meaning. But after considerable pause, he pushed the newspaper over to Robert Audley, and with a face that changed from its dark bronze to sickly, chalky, greyish white, and with an awful calmness in his manner, he pointed with his finger to a line which ran thus, On the 24th, at Ventnor, Isle of Wight, Hill and Tallboys, age 22. Chapter 5 the headstone at Ventnor. Yes, there it was in black and white. Helen Talboys, age 22. When George told the governess on board the Argus that if he had heard any evil tidings of his wife he should drop down dead, he spoke in perfect good faith. And yet here were the worst tidings that could come to him, and he sat rigid, white and helpless, staring stupidly at the shocked face of his friend. The suddenness of the blow had stunned him. In this strange and bewildered state of mind he began to wonder what had happened, and why it was that one line in the Times newspaper could have so horrible an effect upon him. Then by degrees even this vague consciousness of his misfortune faded slowly out of his mind, succeeded by a painful consciousness of external things. 
The hot August sunshine, the dusty window panes and shabby painted blinds. A file of fly-blown playbills fastened to the wall. The black and empty fireplaces. A bald-headed old man nodding over the morning advertiser. The slipshod waiter folding a tumbled tablecloth. And Robert Audley's handsome face looking at him, full of compassionate alarm. He knew that all these things took gigantic proportions, and then, one by one, melted into dark blots and swam before his eyes. He knew that there was a great noise as of half a dozen furious steam engines tearing and grinding in his ears, and he knew nothing more, except that somebody or something fell heavily to the ground. He opened his eyes upon the dusky evening in a cool and shaded room, the silence only broken by the rumbling of wheels at a distance. He looked about him wonderingly, but half indifferently. His old friend Robert Audley was seated by his side smoking. George was lying on a low iron bedstead opposite to an open window, in which there was a stand of flowers and two or three birds in cages. You don't mind the pipe, do you, George? His friend asked, quietly. No. He lay for some time looking at the flowers and the birds. One canary was singing a shrill hymn to the setting sun. Do the birds annoy you, George? Shall I take them out of the room? No, I like to hear them sing. Robert Audley knocked the ashes out of his pipe, laid the precious meerschaum tenderly upon the mantelpiece, and going into the next room returned presently with a cup of strong tea. Take this, George, he said, as he placed the cup on a little table close to George's pillow. This will do your head good. The young man did not answer, but looked slowly round the room and then at his friend's grave face. Bob, he said, where are we? In my chambers, dear boy, in the temple. You have no lodgings of your own, so you may as well stay with me while you're in town. George passed his hand once or twice across his forehead, and then in a hesitating manner said quietly, That newspaper this morning, Bob, what was it? Never mind just now, old boy, drink some tea. Yes, yes, cried George, impatiently, raising himself upon the bed and staring about him with hollow eyes. I remember all about it. Helen, my Helen, my wife, my darling, my only love. Dead, dead. George, said Robert Audley, laying his hand gently upon the young man's arm. You must remember that the person whose name you saw in the paper might not be your wife. There may have been some other Helen Tellboys. No, no, he cried. The age corresponds with hers, and Talboys is such an uncommon name. It may be a misprint for Talbot. No, no, no. My wife is dead. He shook off Robert's restraining hand, and rising from the bed, walked straight to the door. Where are you going? exclaimed his friend. To Ventnor, to see her grave. Not tonight, George, not tonight. I will go with you myself, the first train tomorrow. Robert led them to the bed and gently forced him to lie down again, then gave him an opiate which had been left for him by the medical man whom they had called in at the coffee house in Bridge Street when George fainted. Sir so George Tellboys fell into a heavy slumber and dreamed that he went to Ventnor to find his wife alive and happy, but wrinkled old and grey and to find his son grown into a young man. Early the next morning he was seated opposite to Robert Audley in the first-class carriage of an express, whirling through the pretty open country towards Portsmouth. They landed at Ventnor under the burning heat of the midday sun. As the two young men came from the steamer, the people on the pier stared at George's white face and untrimmed beard. What are we to do, George? Robert Audley asked. 
We have no clue to finding the people you want to see. The young man looked at him with pitiful, bewildered expression. The big dragoon was as helpless as a baby, and Robert Audley, the most vacillating and unenergetic of men, found himself called upon to act for another. He rose superior to himself and equal to the occasion. Have you not better ask at one of the hotels about a Mrs. Talboy's, George, he said. Her father's name was Malden, George muttered. I could never have sent her here to die alone. They said nothing more, but Robert walked straight to a hotel where he inquired from Mr. Malden. Yes, they told him. There was a gentleman of that name stopping at Ventnor. A Captain Malden. His daughter was lately dead. The waiter would go and inquire for the address. The hotel was a busy place at this season, people hurrying in and out, and a great bustle of grooms and waiters about the halls. George Talboys leaned against the doorpost with much the same look in his face as that which had frightened his friend in the Westminster coffee house. The worst was confirmed now. His wife, Captain Meldon's daughter, was dead. The waiter returned in about five minutes to say that Captain Meldon was lodging at Lansdowne Cottage, number four. They easily found the house, a shabby, low-windowed cottage, looking toward the water. Was Captain Meldon at home? No, the landlady said. He had gone out on the beach with his little grandson. Would the gentleman walk in and sit down a bit? George mechanically followed his friend into the little front parlour. Dusty, shabbily furnished and disorderly, with the child's broken toys scattered on the floor and the scent of stale tobacco hanging about the muslin window curtains. Look, said George, pointing to a picture of the mantelpiece. It was his own portrait, painted in the old dragooning days. A pretty good likeness representing him in uniform with his charger in the background. Perhaps the most animated of men would have been scarcely so wise a comforter as Robert Audley. He did not utter a word to the stricken widower, but quietly seated himself with his back to George, looking out of the open window. For some time the young man wandered restlessly about the room looking at and sometimes touching the knick-knacks lying here and there. Her workbox with an unfinished piece of work, her album full of extracts from Byron and Moore, written in his own scrawling hand, some books which he had given her and a bunch of withered flowers in a vase they had bought in Italy. Her portrait used to hang by the side of mine, he muttered. I wonder what they have done with it. By and by, he said after about an hour's silence. I should like to see the woman of the house. I should like to ask her about... He broke down and buried his face in his hands. Robert summoned the landlady. She was a good-natured, garrulous creature, accustomed to sickness and death, for many of her lodgers came to her to die. She told all the particulars of Mrs. Talboy's last hours, how she had come to Ventnor only ten days before her death, in the last stage of decline, and how day by day she had gradually but surely sunk under the fateful malady. Was the gentleman any relative, she asked of Robert Audley, as George sobbed aloud. Yes, he's the lady's husband. What? the woman cried. Him has deserted her so cruel and left her with a pretty boy upon her poor old father's hands, which Captain Mulden has told me often with tears in his poor eyes. I did not desert her, George cried out, and then he told the history of his three years' struggle. Did she speak of me, he asked. Did she speak of me, at, at the last? 
No, she went off quiet as a lamb. She said very little from the first. But the last day she knew nobody, not even her little boy, nor even her poor old father, who took on awful. Once she went off wild-like, talking about her mother and the cruel shame it was to leave her to die in a strange place, till it was quite pitiful to hear her. Her mother died when she was quite a child, said George, to think that she should remember her and speak of her, but never once of me. The woman took him into the little bedroom in which his wife had died. He knelt down by the bed and kissed the pillow tenderly, the landlady crying as he did so. While he was kneeling, praying, perhaps with his face buried in the humble, snow-white pillow, the woman took something from a drawer. She gave it to him when he rose from his knees. It was a long tress of hair wrapped in silver paper. I cut this off when she lay in her coffin, she said. Poor dear. He pressed the soft lock to his lips. Yes, he murmured. This is the dear hair that I've kissed so often when her head lay upon my shoulder. But it always had a rippling wave in it then, and now it seems smooth and straight. It changes in illness, said the landlady. If you'd like to see where they have laid her, Mr. Tolboys. My little boy shall show you the way to the churchyard. Sir George Tellboys and his faithful friend walked to the quiet spot, where beneath a mound of earth, to which the patches of fresh turf hardly adhered, lay that wife of whose welcoming smile George had dreamed so often in the far antipodes. Robert left the young man by the side of this newly made grave and returning in about a quarter of an hour, found that he had not once stirred. He looked up presently and said that if there was a stonemason's anywhere near, he should like to give an order. They very easily found the stonemason, and sitting down amidst the fragmentary litter of the man's yard, George Tellboys wrote in pencil this brief inscription for the headstone of his dead wife's grave. Sacred to the memory of Helen, beloved wife of George Tellboys, who departed this life, age 24th, 1822, deeply regretted by her sorrowing husband. And on that sad and rather mystifying note, I'm going to leave it there for tonight. If you'd like to pick up where we're leaving off, you can, as always, find the original on Project Gutenberg at the link in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes are released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. But make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiko. Check out more of their work on their website, which you'll find linked in the show notes. Good night and sweet dreams.